I want to talk about the change of basis theorem in linear algebra. And uh, so here's the situation. We've got a finite dimensional vector space. That means it actually does have a basis in the usual sense, a finite number of vectors. Say e1, e2, and e3, for example, in this three-dimensional example, such that every vector and any random vector v can be built as a unique linear combination of those guys. And I've got a transformation, linear transformation t from v to itself. Now I'm, I've drawn tron I've drawn two separate copies of V to make clear the source and the target. And to be honest, the more general version of this is where this is a different vector space, different vector space, different basis, obviously, because it lives in a different sort of universe. Um, and this gets a little more complicated then. But this really encapsulates the main thing, and this is uh, what my students need right now. So um, I've got this linear transformation. Now, this is in, I labeled this geometric reality. I do not want to think of V, even though I put some axes on here to kind of give some context, I don't want to think of this as exactly R3 or Rn. Um, it's some geometric space, like an actual model of a part of physical space, for example, or it could be a space of functions, or it could be all kinds of um, structures, all kinds of spaces that have the structure of a vector space. Um, so that's the geometric reality. So I want, you, we want us to think of that as some place where the arrows actually have a physical meaning, not necessarily as n-tuples of numbers, and certainly not something where there's some sort of God-given coordinates that we have to use. Now, to do explicit calculations, we often do want to do things in coordinates. And what do we use this basis for? Very often what we use the basis for is we take this basis and we express V and we map it to Rn by saying V is, let's say, A1 v1, or sorry, e1, plus a2, e2, plus a3, a3 e3. And so that gives us an n-tuple, n-tuple in general, in this case a triple, of numbers a1, a2, and a3, and that is what lives in Rn. Okay, And so it's not hard to show that that's a linear mapping, that's a linear transformation from the geometric reality to this um, algebraic sort of numerical representation. It's not the reality and it's not unique. And I can't sorry, you can't see the last few things there. Algebraic or numerical representation. So that's what this brown is about is an explicit but somewhat arbitrary way to describe the reality up here. And that un understanding, that thing, I want you to carry with the whole video. Okay, I'm going to fix that A, because that's just horrible. And I'll fix the E one. Okay, so, um, so the sophisticated version of, or one of the somewhat more sophisticated things you can do with a basis is this idea of taking any vector and expressing it in coordinates and thinking of that as a linear transformation from the abstract vector space to a very concrete vector space. And we'll call that linear transformation coordinates based on the basis B, where script B will be just the collection of these guys. In this case, E1, E2, E3. Okay, and I'm realizing I think the book uses V, V1, V2, V3, so I might switch that so it's not too um, incompatible with the book I'm using. This is Schifrin's multivariable mathematics book. Okay, so, um, that's how to express a vector in terms of the coordinates. And then the claim is you can express a transformation in terms of those coordinates. And it's really just a generalization of what we always do of thinking of a transformation and its standard basis in the standard matrix if you if this really is secretly Rn. Okay? But I don't want to think of it as being Rn. So um, here's how we do that. We just realize that here's V. It has a, an exp expression in terms of the standard basis vectors, and here's T of V. If we could relate those guys on the level of coordinates, we'd be good, okay? And what we want to do is we want to realize this transformation is defined on all possible vectors V, but one of the crucial things about linear transformations and bases is that if we know what it does on E1, E2, and E3, or in general, the whole basis B, then I know what it does on anything. And so I don't have to actually take a random input and put it in. I just have to say what it does on all these guys. So, for example, Maybe, um, let's see, I guess I'm using red for basis vectors. Oh, let's use pink for outputs of the transformation. So maybe this is T E1, and this is T of E2, and over here is T of E3. Okay, I know it's getting kind of messy over here. If I can just 
explicitly describe those three vectors, then I'm good. And how do I explicitly describe those three vectors? Oh, I could use the same coordinate idea and just get express those in a basis. Okay, so, well, it's kind of good that it's getting messy because I got to erase it anyway. Okay, so in terms of algebra, what does this mean? What we're going to do is we're going to input all of our basis vectors. So, say, so again, just to make the notation consistent, I'm going to change these to Vs. I like to call them E's often, but this, that's often reserved for the honest-to-God um, standard basis of Rn. So I should have realized that I shouldn't have done that. So I'm going to take each of the basis vectors of the input space. So again, that's over here. V goes to V. I should be using pink or purple or something like that. So I'm going to take each of those vectors, and I'm going to see where it goes. So there's, I guess I'm going to call it V1 now, T of V1. And I'm going to express that as a linear combination of those same vec basis vectors. So it's some, some coefficient, and I'm going to talk about how we might want to denote these in a second. So I'm leaving spaces for the coefficients, plus dot dot dot, plus v sub n, assuming the dimension is n. Okay. Now, uh, there's two things here, uh, and I'm going to even just switch that to a j to, again, make the indices come out with the book. So I'm going to take the jth basis vector, I'm going to put it in, and then there's going to be some numbers to put in here. Now, for each of the base input basis vectors, I'm going to get a vector, and I'm going to get n components of that guy, to n coefficients in front of the basis. And then I'm going to do this n times, so I need a double subscript. And let's just have a kind of a boring letter for it to collect them all. So that's going to be a1j plus a2j all the way up through a n j. And the way we're writing the way I chose the j to be the second index makes it work out with matrices very nicely. Okay, it, it agrees with the idea of how you do this with the standard basis. For example, if this is if we are talking about the standard basis, what do you, how you get the coefficients of the matrix, the standard matrix in the standard basis for R n? You put in the, the basis vectors and then that should give you the columns, okay? And so here, the special case would be if I take T of Ej, that, now that will be really the standard basis of Rn, okay? And then I express it as a combination of E1 through En. Well, that's nothing more nor less than taking A1j, A2j, taking the column vector. Because when you take these guys to be the standard basis, it just ends up being the column vector. Oh, okay. That's, and that makes sense, because that's the jth column. That j is the column index. That's the jth column of the standard matrix of T. If we're in Rn, and we're, doing, we're generalizing that. Okay, so this is the more generalized version of that. So it's going to give us an n by n matrix with all these numbers creates n by n matrix, and we'll call that A. And if we want an official name for it, it will be the matrix of T using the basis B, where the basis B is this collection of vectors. Okay. Um, and so, let's see. Now, the trouble with all this is this depends on this choice of basis. Ideally, we would understand, understand t in its own terms, just as its own thing. It's a function, and sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you do not have to go to coordinates, but often you do. And the problem is, there might not be an agreement on exactly what the best coordinates to use are, or there might be some really good reason to use two different ones, and you need to relate uh, the numbers you get. Because these numbers depend not only on the transformation, but they depend very much on the basis you use to express the inputs and outputs. Okay, And so what we need to do is we need to understand how those relate. And the motivation for us in this book is that we're going to discover that you start with a transformation that might have a bad matrix in some basis, in particular maybe in the standard basis, maybe it really is from Rn to Rn, but the standard matrix is horrible and hard to understand. There's often a much better basis that will make the, the matrix in the new basis easier to understand. But we got to understand this idea of what it would mean to have a matrix in a new basis, and it really helps to understand how to change, how to translate from one to the other. Okay, so we've now defined explicitly how this work, this this diagram works. So here's a this is on page 416 of Schifrin. If you happen to have this book, it's a great book. I'm happy I chose it. Okay, so this is just the same diagram I started with, but without the pictures. Okay, and so we've now got. 
um, if I take a vector v in here, this is a nice, fairly, very modern, fairly sophisticated way of thinking about what we just did. I take a vector in v in here, that pushes over to t of v, okay? And then I can take that and express that in terms of the coefficients here. Um, this is going to be the matrix or the the um, the Rn the actual column vector, the coordinates, let's say, of T of V expressed in the matrix matrix B, in the basis B. There's a lot of terminology. What I could also do is I could take V and I could express V in the basis B. And to give a name that's not just like empty brackets with a little dot in or something, we call that C, the map C sub B. But that's the other notation for it. Just take V and express it in the basis B. Okay. Um, well, actually, you know, I think he's reserving that for transformation. So let's actually, let's actually call that C B of T of V. Okay. Mm, so that's C B of V. Okay. So this is the numerical version of the input. This is the numerical version of the output. I want something that just goes straight from the numerical version of the input to the numerical version of the output. The claim is that that's exactly what this matrix A does. Okay, and so it fits into this picture of everything's a, a space or a map. Okay, um, and so the claim, the first claim, is that A just matrix times vector on this column vector C B of V is equal to the numerical version of this guy. Okay, a way to say that is what, what people say is that this diagram commutes. Is that if you take any input here and you go this way around the diagram, that's this guy, or you go this way, do do, then that ends up being a. This just means multiply by a times the coordinate version of the input. Okay, it's a very elegant way to do things, and it gives us a lot of power for proving things. Okay, and I claim this really, there's not much to prove here. This is really just a restatement of the definition of A, okay? Because what is C, B of V? That's the, that's like for any vector that's V1. Well, it also uses linearity. It's, it's important to use linearity. So let's say that has V1 through Vn, where V is equal to V1, E1, plus V1. <laughs> ah, see, this is where I, this is where I don't want to use V. Oh, my bad. See, this is why I don't like using V for, for basis, for basis. Let's just switch this to something else. Oh, let's call it W. I bet he has a, if I looked over there. Okay, let's call this random vector W because I decided to go with his. Okay, so W is going to be W1, V1 plus through WN, VN. So I take W and I express it as some linear combination of the ingredients, the, the basis vectors. Okay. And now we're ready to go. Okay. So this guy, so A is this matrix with A11, A1N. And we've we've seen the definition of that guy. I'm going to try not to make this too long. I'll cut it off in a minute. And then the claim is that if I take that matrix times vector on this guy, that's just going to be the um, expression of T of W in the same basis, okay? Well, how do we make sure that's true? We just make sure that when we um, put this together, this is some column vector, to check that this is really the right coordinate expression of the geometric vector T of W in the basis B, these V1 through Vn's, well, you can check that just by reassembling it. Is it true? So let's see, let's just uh, give names to this guy. This will be, let's say, U1 through Un. Is it true? You just check U1 V1 plus Un Vn. If that does equal T of V, these are honest to God vectors. So this says take these formal, uh, the formal recipe, the U1 through UN, the numbers, use them with the actual ingredients in geometric space to create a vector. Is that the, does that actually create the output of the linear transformation? So that's what we need to check. Okay, but and not a lot of space here. I hate to destroy the diagram, but I think I can. Okay. So, but here's the definition of these guys. So let's write it out with some sigmas. UI 
any particular UI here is just the sum uh, over j equals 1 to n of a i j, because you take this row times this whole column, so that's the column index is varying, times w sub j. Okay. But um, and that's what the UI is. Okay, so now I'm going to take the sum of all those guys times the basis vectors. That's what I'm supposed to be doing to check. And I'd like this to recover T of V. Okay, mm, well, let's see. Now I just substitute it in. I'm going to get a double sum. I equals 1 to N. Uh, and then this, this guy is the sum J equals 1 to N of A, I, J w, j, v, i. I'm not going to reverse the sum. If you have a double summation and you're not reversing it, you're probably not getting it. Okay. And then that's going to be the sum. Now, with the j, um, I can pull out this guy, w, j. Um, and then that's the sum, i equals 1 to n, a, i, j, v, i. Hmm. AIJ, some AIJVI, that's interesting. By definition of the AIJs, that is T of V. Sorry, T of VI. That's the sum, J equals 1 to N, times T of VI. So this is where we use the fact that the A's are encoding the action of, of uh, T on the basis vectors. Why is that enough? Uh, that's a J. That's a J. Okay. Why is that enough? It's because T is assumed to be a linear transformation. If I take a combination, T on the basis vectors with a certain combination, a certain coefficients, well, that's the same thing by linearity as T of that sum. W, J, V, J. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, that's just V expressed as W. That's just the input vector W expressed as, um, as in terms of the basis vectors. Okay, so this is an example of how these uh, calculations work, and that verifies that there's these two different ways to think about it. There's the way where we uh, think about a bunch of numbers attached to things, but then there's also this beautiful, beautiful picture, that's a V, where everything in sight is a mapping or a space. Some abstract geometric space, or maybe a real physical, ge physical geometric space. And then a very numerical thing, just n-tuples of numbers. And you've got the translation from reality to the, the, the numerical representation of it, which is dependent on the pace at basis b. And then how does that give us a representation of the transformation? It fits right here. Okay, And that's a very, very nice thing. Definitely time to stop. That was longer than I thought it would be.